Hi everyone, it's uh, Jorge Suarez and Mary Kiyork from Kiyork Immigration Law. How are you today? Uh, we wanted to talk about, Mary wanted me to talk about my journey from Cuba to the States, uh, which I didn't do by myself. The, the way it worked is my mom, uh, she filled out what I think is still called uh, lottery visa. Uh, There's an agreement between the states and Cuba that a certain amount of people can go to the states uh, after being approved as doing uh, paperwork. Uh, and I believe she's filled it out in 1998, if I'm correct. Sorry, mom, if it wasn't correct, but 1998. And back then, it wasn't on the computer, it wasn't on the internet, it was by hand on paper and you had to fill it out and send it by mail. Um, and sorry to cut you, but yeah. this was also, I've heard, I know that this still exists and it's also in, in other countries too, I know. Um, yeah, the, like Haiti, I believe. Armenia. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if it's like certain types of countries that are more, where more people want to leave or. I think it's sure. a matter of, uh, Countries that are like oppressed, right? That type of stuff. Um, to give an opportunity. Right, right, right. To a certain amount of people, it's like not everybody uh, gets approved. Mm. Um, so she filled it out in 1998, um, and it's one of those things that you fill out and you kind of forget about it because it takes a while to get a response back. And if I'm correct, we got. A, we got a response about nine years later, uh, 2007. That's 2006. really long. Yeah, I, I believe it will take about eight, nine years. Wow. Um, of course, by then we have moved. We moved houses. Um, I was in school. And what city were you living in? Havana. Mm -hmm. In Havana. Uh, luckily, uh, everybody knew there was those. The response, the, the the mail back will come in this particular uh, Manila envelope, like a yellow envelope, and everybody knew what that meant. Right. Uh, it meant that whoever got it is has an opportunity to leave the country. So luckily, the people that got it at the previous house, at the original address, they were kind enough to actually search for us and find us and tell us, "Hey, you're leaving the country. You got this." Wow. You've received this. But that means it was on someone's desk for like eight years. Yeah, I'm not sure what the logistics behind it are, but uh, yeah, it took a long time. I mean, I don't know if I have any document on my desk, like if I've had it there for eight years or even in like a shelf, on a shelf for eight years. I think, um, I honestly don't remember if it goes if the application goes to the U.S. or to goes to Cuba or the moves around or the embassy in Cuba of the U.S. Um, whatever it is, it gets stuck in some kind of loop forever <laughs> until eventually it comes out of it. The dark abyss of file uh, immigration and, or, yeah. yeah. Um, so back then, it's not the same now. Don't call me on now but back then once you receive this application of approval to leave the country uh, you're pretty much considered an enemy of the state you're a traitor a gusano in spanish gusano gusano like a worm oh so you're that's not nice yeah but that's the communist behavior the communist uh, trend of thought yeah um, so as soon as you receive that you are supposed to quit school, quit your job, because you're leaving. Um, there is an inspector that goes to your house. There's an inspector that goes to your house and they note everything that you own, because now it's property of the state. So when you got the letter, you had to advise the government of Cuba you got it, or they already knew you got it? Well, I was a kid. I was about... 16 at the time, um, 
I believe so because you have to you have to start some paperwork on the Cuban side. Okay. So they are aware that you're gonna that you're planning to leave. Because some people receive it, but they choose not to, and they're like patriots. Right. Right. Uh, most people do leave. Um, well, the people that can afford it. That's the whole topic about that. Um, so yeah, you're supposed to leave everything behind. Uh, so Cuba being Cuba, what you do is well. You pay money to the inspector, and you only put down X, Y, Z, this and that, and you try to sell the rest so you have some money when you actually leave to the states. Uh, that's the kind of stuff that works in Cuba. That's, a, that's the way it works. And this whole process, it didn't just <clears throat> when you got the approval, you weren't leaving anytime soon. It still oh. took a while. Oh yeah, yeah, it <laughs> took about two, uh, two, three more years. Wow. Uh, I had to quit school. I had to leave my, my school so my parents have to leave the work um, that, then, must, that must have been hard yeah it was pretty hard I have a I had a girlfriend back then and uh, I had to tell her that I was leaving and uh, their parents weren't too happy about it because the parents were communist uh, so they were like don't come here again see ya were, were your parents communist no. no maybe if they were when they were So they saw the lights. So it's, yeah. um, and um, just to add on that, like I know that I've been to Cuba twice. And uh, I don't remember the first year I went. It was like maybe three, four years ago. I went two years in a row. And uh, I went to Cayo Coco. And of course, I went on uh, resorts. And even though I'm the type of traveler that likes to get to know the people that live there. I talked to a lot of people. I talked to a lot of uh, the employees at the hotel. I made friends. Um, with my friend, I went, we went to the local towns and we we saw and we talked and to people. And I remember when I met you, I told you, oh, I love Cuba. Cuba is so amazing and people are so nice. And and I had this, this understanding like, Oh, it's really hard there, but people really appreciate what they have, and they, um, despite the difficulties, they, they're, you know, they thrive, they're thrive or they yeah. do the best they can. And over here in North America, we are, we're not grateful for what we have. And then you told me, well, a part of that's true. Uh, it, it is true. Uh, not just because I'm Cuban, but uh, most people that meet Cubans, they admire the resilience and the way of working and the way of thinking because we come up with solutions out of nowhere, out of nothing. Because that's the way to live in Cuba. You make the best of whatever what you'll have. But on the same on the same thought, uh, people that tell me like you did at the beginning, uh, I love Cuba. And it's awesome and this and that. Yeah, you're seeing the Cuba from the tourist perspective. You're seeing it from the tourist uh, set of eyes, which is fine, but it's not the real Cuba. You have to go to Havana. You have to actually talk to the people that you know have their their daily day to day and the way of doing things. Uh, again, there's nothing wrong with being a tourist and enjoying it. That's that's what it's for, and people make a living out of that. Um, but the kind I, of stuff that you told me that I had no idea about was periods of time where there was literally no food. Oh, well, yeah. That's the, the special period in the 90s, uh, right after the USSR fell. The USSR, I believe, was the only uh, friend that the Cuba had because of communism. And it was the only country that had an import export at the time and it was one of the biggest allies. Well, when it fell, all that export importation kind of fell through and there was a lack of everything. Yeah. Um, if there was anything, it was very expensive, extremely expensive in dollars, which normal people don't make money in dollars. At the time it was US dollars. Uh, you make money in pesos. I believe back then, back then it was 25, 26 pesos for a dollar. 
so if you make 100 pesos a month, you make four dollars. So let's say if a piece of meat costs, a piece of chicken costs uh, two and a half, then you just use your half of the salary. Yeah. So that kind of stuff. Yeah. And that reminded me. Um, my background is Armenian, and I I traveled to Armenia. I've been there three times. I went there when I uh, in 2006, and I, I I volunteered there, lived there for about three months. And um, when you were telling me, when you tell me these stories, there's a lot of resemblance resemblance between Armenia and Cuba because same as Armenia, it was under Soviet rule for so long. Right. And uh, in 1991, I believe, when they declared independence, it was such a great moment. But at the same time, it was some of the dark, darkest moments in right. Armenia because there was no light, no food, no electricity, and um, it's 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 very similar in, in very in a very uh, eerie way. And for me, when I went to Armenia, um, when I went to Cuba, I remember I saw. The, the materials, like the, the door handles, uh, just the way things were made at restaurants, at government buildings were the same, exact same as in Armenia, because Russia yeah, because would, like, sh would ship materials yeah. to Cuba. So it's just, and also between, in our relationship, sometimes we have similar things that because just the way our parents were we just the background yeah. the background of communism and it, it was interesting because i obviously i'm not a communist you're not a communist but there's ways that we have that are come down from communism yeah they're engraved right yeah. so even if you don't want it that way it's so kind of the back of him right and it's so interesting because i mean i'm born in canada to armenian parents you're born in cuba we could not be further worlds apart but in a way there's this there are these simil similarities that are interesting yeah. um yeah, yeah. yeah so okay so let's get back to so the, the 90s yeah. so we were talking about the 90s how how bad it was uh, i was a kid i was i was born in 1988 so i was in my you know five years old six years old and but i remember my mom telling me later on that it was very bad because there was a lack of food, lack of everything, lack of uh, your basic needs. And one of the things that she reminds me is that people were selling pizzas with no cheese. The cheese were actual uh, melted condoms. This is that, that every time you say that it's so. I just, I mean, uh, I just can't wrap my mind around that. Yeah, I mean, because. I even Googled it to see if it was true. I didn't find anything, but yeah. I think you have to be there to have seen that. Yeah, um, I'm pretty sure it wasn't like um, the whole island was doing this, but you could you have to be careful where you went because oh. it wasn't like it wasn't like they're saying, "Hey, you know, here, here's a pizza with condoms." No, of course not. It's just that this particular place couldn't afford to buy cheese, so they opted for something similar. And you know, that's, it's, what, that's it's, pretty much what it is. It's when I hear stories like this that I'm just like, like, I just can't wait for Cuba to just one day just get better and better. And I mean, yeah. it has gotten better in the last years. Uh, I haven't been back to Cuba in the past three years now, two years. Um, I started going back again uh, maybe five years ago. I was going for about a year uh, every month. And I did notice that there were a lot of businesses because people in Miami or people from outside are putting money in and they're opening new things. So that's good. Uh, so the, the, But still, there's still like... No, of course. There's still oppression. There's still uh, not freedom of speech. And propaganda. There's, there's, there's plenty of propaganda. I was telling somebody that in the States or anywhere else, you see, like right now, I see uh, advertisement signs for... That is turban, whatever. Um, over there, everything has Fidel's face on it, so that's the yes, advertisement. I rem remember it's just, seeing that. It's, uh, yeah. it's just terrible, but uh, that's where it is. And uh, I remember when you first, this kind of a tangent, but when you came to Canada first time and you saw all these ads in the metros. Uh, in the streets, like vacation, go to Cuba, go okay. on vacation. It was weird for you because you don't have that in the states. 
Yeah, it was very weird because the states, uh, people go to Cuba, they, they do, different ways to make it happen, but yeah, yeah you don't see that. I, it, was, it was very odd for me, all the scene, like uh, Havana Club and the, in the, in the grocery stores and the, uh, the SIQ. Like um, it was very odd for me to see that. So, I mean, I was really, I was, it was nice, but at the same time, I was like, wow, this is odd. Seeing Cuba being advertised in the metro, go to Cuba, enjoy you know, the beach. Yes. Uh, so going back to the time where you and your family decided to finally you were able to leave. Yeah, well, it took a long time. It took about two to three years. Um, first of all, one of the things that was hindering it was um, at 18 years old. Uh, there is mandatory service with the army so i didn't do that because i got that opportunity to leave right before so i was okay not doing it but the government had to approve it so that piece of paper with that uh, stamp took a while took a long time took a, a like i don't know how many trips for my mom and i to go to this one office i think it was in la Vibora. Uh, to go and check every single Sunday after where we're going. <laughs> is it done? Is it done? Is it done? Can we pay somebody? Is it done? What are we going to do? Uh, it, came, it, it took so long that at one point, at one point my friends were like, are you sure you're leaving? Because it's been so long. Are you sure you're actually going to the States? And I'm like, yeah, I, yeah, I think so. And it's just a 45 minute flight. I know. I know. We had the passports and everything. Oh and what I was saying before with the money is as soon as you're ready to go, all the paperwork, all the stamps, everything is in dollars. Okay. The passport is in dollars. Right. Everything, everything, everything is in, uh, everything uh, that goes bureaucracy is in dollars. So yeah, you're approved, but if you can't afford all the paperwork and you can afford to pay it, you're not going anywhere. So that's when people rely on the family in Miami or in the States, whatever So they you are. were lucky because you had an aunt in uh, Naples. I had an aunt in Naples, Florida, and she supported us. But uh, also my mom had saved for this kind of stuff. So she had mm -hmm. money and uh, she was able to afford it and pay it. Uh, we were in a situation, we were okay. Uh, my mom was actually working in tourism, so we were okay. But um, the main reason she left was because of me, because she knew that me working in IT, me working in computers in the States would only mean one thing eventually, me going to jail. Because most people that work in IT or work in that kind of uh, environment, they end up stealing, not because they really want to steal, but it's because it's the way it works. Right. Uh, stealing to sell it for more, and then money for your family right because everybody everybody at does some that. point or they do that black that's, market yeah exactly underground yeah. Yeah. yeah and the government knows that people do that it's just like well but if you get caught you get caught and you know there's only so much there's only so much pain you can do right uh, yeah so how did you feel when you got on the plane uh it was very nice. I I don't remember everything, but I remember because my, my my dad actually left before us because we were like, oh, this is gonna take forever, forever, forever. You go ahead and uh, uh, start your life. Let's see what we can do. Yeah. Uh, get a job and maybe support us and whatever. Um. So he left before the four of us and. Um, I remember that when we landed and um, we saw him, the first thing he had in his hand was uh, a large fry from McDonald's. For that, you. That was the first thing I ate <laughs> when I went to the States. And to this day, he enjoys McDonald's very much. I do. <laughs> uh, sometimes, yeah, I do. Um, yeah, and everybody asked me, well, like, what was the most shocking thing? And, the most the most shocking shocking thing that I that happened to me when I landed in the States was going in the garage. It was nighttime, I believe it was raining. And seeing how shiny all the cars were. 
how the light was like everywhere. All the cars were like nice and shiny, really nice, like a clear coating, uh, nice painting, uh, good, good quality. Everything was nice and shiny. So then the, in Cuba, everything is pretty much all way around. So everything can uh, mate, mate. And the cars are and super the cars old. old and uh, run down. So that would be like, that was like the wake up, like you're not in Cuba anymore. Yeah. Yeah. What an interesting story. I always love hearing it again. Yeah. Just, yeah. Um, thank you for sharing. No problem. And maybe next video we can talk about your arrival to the U.S. and your integration. Yeah. Because that's interesting too, what, yeah. what you did and what your mom did. Um, yeah, we'll do a part two. Yeah, stay tuned. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.